Well, I'm so glad you're here with us this Sunday night, and what a blessing it is. Tonight, we are going to be in 1 Kings chapter 19. The title of my message is Running on Empty, Finding Your Strength in the Wilderness. And so would you join me in prayer as we begin? Lord God, we just thank you. Lord, we thank you for what a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord tonight. And so, Lord, as we look at this story tonight in 1 Kings 19, as we look at the story of Elijah, Lord, would you just speak to our hearts? Lord, would we remember that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and God, that you are here with us now. Wherever we are in our journey of faith with you, God, you meet us here. And Lord, in the gentle whisper tonight, God, we pray you would speak to our hearts, bring refreshment, bring excitement, bring a refuel by your spirit and by your word tonight, that our faith may increase. We love you and give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. And so... Tonight, we're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 19 and really looking at the story of Elijah. Our student ministry has been studying 1 and 2 Kings on Sunday mornings. We go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and study through the Bible together. And so in that, I I kind of left off a little bit of Elijah, and I wanted to have an opportunity to, to share one of my favorite stories, a powerful story from 1 Kings 19. And the reason why I think this story is so just astonishing and amazing is Elijah is an amazing character in scripture. And many times we see these people in scripture and they're so confident in God. They do just such amazing things and God moves in them and through them in so many powerful ways. But this story, is a little refreshing because we see Elijah in his weakness. And I don't know about you, but when I read one of those kind of stories in the Bible, I'm a little bit encouraged in a way like, man, okay, well, I guess If Elijah is struggling with faith, like maybe it's okay that I struggle a little bit sometimes. It's kind of encouraging and it gives us a reminder that the people we read about in scripture, that they were human, just like us. And many of us, we've gone through seasons like this, seasons where we're just burnt out. If we just admit it to ourselves, we're running on empty and in our relationship to the Lord, we just feel like we're in a season of, of spiritual darkness, of struggle, of questioning. Maybe you've even like been in that season recently where you've just said, God, I need your help here. I'm just like, I got too much on my plate. I don't even know how I'm going to handle all of these things. It seems like life is just toppling in on me, Lord. I, I need some help. Help me, Lord. Elijah found himself in that same predicament and, and he found himself in a place where he just wanted to throw in the towel. So what an encouragement to us when we feel that way. Well, a little review on Elijah. Like I said, a powerful character in scripture. He was a prophet during the reign of King Ahab the northern, in the northern kingdom of Israel. And Elijah uh, called out this very evil, we know Ahab to be a very evil king. Even in scripture it says that he was the most evil king that Israel had up until that time. And he had married a woman named Jezebel, notorious in scripture for being evil and doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And they brought about this this idol worship of Baal and Asherah. Baal and Asherah were these male and female gods of rain and fertility. And so God sends Elijah into this mess of, of their kingdom and he calls them out and he declares this in 1 Kings 17. As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And so God, through Elijah, is sending this message. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Worship Baal, the God of rain. There's not gonna even be dew on the ground for three and a half years. Sending that message to to them that, uh uh the God of the universe is the only one who allows it to rain and it's gonna stop for a while. And so what does this create in the land? It creates drought. In Samaria, there's such dryness and famine like never before. And so the people, it just amazes me. Three and a half years of drought, of famine, of dryness, no rain. And what are they still doing? Still worshiping Baal. Still worshiping Asherah. Still worshiping these Gods of the rain that aren't bringing rain. It's just such an interesting thing about human sinfulness and pridefulness and the hardness of the human heart that they would still refuse. And so 
God, after this three and a half years, sends Elijah. And there is going to be a showdown. So Elijah calls Ahab to bring 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah to Mount Carmel. And we maybe remember this story as this powerful story as Elijah stands before them and gives this speech in, in 1 Kings 18. It says, Elijah came near to the people and said, how long, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. So there's a line drawn in the sand. And then Elijah tells of the showdown that's about to go here. Elijah will have an ox and an altar. The prophets of Baal will have their oxen and their altar. And then they will both call down fire from heaven. The God who brings the fire is the winner. And so the prophets of Baal, we remember the story, they're, they're going crazy. They're singing, they're shouting, they're cutting themselves, offering up a loud ruckus, trying to get Baal to bring about fire. And nothing happens. And even Elijah's like, come on, get a little bit louder. Scream, yell. And nothing happens. And then Elijah, in a quiet prayer, goes before the Lord and offers up a quiet prayer of, of provision, asking the Lord to bring down fire. And boy, does fire come down. The Lord provides in such a miraculous way that all of the people viewing this, their response is to begin to cry out, the Lord, he is God, Yahweh, he is God. They see the power of God. And so God wins this showdown and Elijah says, grab those prophets and kill them here. Let them no longer continue to have this reign over the people. Great boldness, great bravery. And then he offers up a prayer. And after his servant returns seven times, we know the story is it begins to rain. And God brings the rain. And so Elijah sends Ahab. He says, go back to Jezreel. And Ahab gets in his chariot and begins to head towards Jezreel. And in that, God just wants to display his power once more through Elijah. And so Elijah begins to run and is so filled with the power of the spirit of God that he runs and beats the chariot. <laughs> he outruns Ahab's chariot. So like just once again, showing that Elijah is empowered by, the, by God, running 30 miles to get to Jezreel. And that brings us to our story here. So we see it. Elijah's something, you know, something, right? He's a powerful prophet. God is moving in his ministry. It's a great victory. But as we know, where there's great victory, quickly, many times, it becomes a great fall. And so let's, get, let's look now, 1 Kings, starting in verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. But he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness. It's like a desert land and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life for I am not better than my father's. Let's pause there. Five verses. He goes from being on a mountaintop a victorious moment. He's a spirit-filled runner to being a scaredy cat coward curled up under a bush saying, Lord, kill me. Five verses. It's amazing how the mountaintops are followed by valleys. And just in these few verses, we see Elijah's humanness. We see his struggle. As the uh, author in James says in James chapter 5, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I love that verse. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Elijah had a nature like ours. You see, even the best of men and the best of women are just men at best, women at best. 
Elijah quickly falling flat on his face after such an amazing season of victory. You see, we oftentimes elevate these women and, and these men of God that we see in scripture, but no one is perfect besides Christ. None of them fully passed the test. And so I remember a pastor saying this, even the best of men are men at best. Elijah lost sight. He lost sight of his role as a prophet. He lost sight of God's power and provision. And in verse three, if you look at it, in our translation of NASB, it says, he was afraid. If you were to look at it in the Hebrew, the phrase would be, and when he saw, when he saw the message that Jezebel had sent, that she was gonna take him out, he focused his gaze upon the message. And in that, you just see the condition of his heart. His circumstances, what has been laid before him and what happens, he's, I gotta get out of here. I gotta run. She's gonna kill me. He allowed Jezebel's threats to persuade him about what God had said. He believed the lies. And the one who was truly defeated in this story was Jezebel. Isn't that interesting? Like this is actually, like Ahab is bringing her news that she lost that Baal lost. And, and what is her response? Well, I think it's what the response of any evil person does. When their back is up against the wall, what comes out of them when they're hard pressed? More evil. Oh, you're not gonna take me down without a fight. In the same way that when godly men and women are pressed up against the wall, what comes out of them? Godly character, integrity. And so in the same way Jezebel says, no, no, I'm not going down without a fight. And in the process, she heaps this threat. And Elijah's confidence is sunk from it. She's the one who was losing. And Elijah allowed himself defeated by a simple threat. His faith shaken. And so what do we do when our back is up against the wall? When circumstances have, have hard pressed us? Well, many of us, we either fight, we stand in confidence, we're gonna take on the day, or we do what Elijah did. We run, we flee and he didn't just run a short distance. So from Jezreel to Beersheba was 85 miles south. He ran, he ran far. And even from that, he left his servant and went further into the distance, into the, uh, into the wilderness. And he lies under a juniper tree, which is not really a tree itself. It's, it's actually a bush. And in order to receive shade from this bush, you would have to lay down or sit down underneath it. It wasn't really a, a, a tree that would give a lot of shade unless you were laying under it. It's, it's like laying under a bush. And there he is exhausted. And he says, Lord, just kill me. I'm done. He says, it is enough now, Lord. Take my life. I am not better than my fathers. He just says, I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. I'm broken. I give up. He's like literally handing it. He's like, I'm done being a prophet. I give up. He's resigning. His letter of resignation before the Lord. It's interesting to note just about this. When he says, kill me, Lord, that Elijah isn't gonna get that prayer ever answered. Isn't that interesting? If you know the story of Elijah, he doesn't die. The Lord takes him up to heaven in a chariot of fire. And so the Lord's like, no, 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 no. I got, I got more for you. And even, even then at the end, I'm not gonna kill you. You're not gonna even see death. Powerful. So Elijah is saying to the Lord, he has nothing left to give. And he just declares, I'm a failure. I'm done. Many of us have felt that exact way. So God will meet with him. This is so cool. God's gonna meet with him here. God's gonna set up a spot for him to be restored. Let's continue reading in verse five, chapter 19, verse five. He lay down and slept under the juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, arise, eat. Then he looked and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and laid down again. The angel of the Lord came again in a second time and touched him and said, arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Let's pause. Exhaustion will lead to unfaithfulness and exhaustion will lead to spiritual coldness. 
That's what I feel like we see here. I believe that he was exhausted. Let's just take a tally real quick of how far he traveled. So 30 miles from Mount Carmel to Jezreel, then 85 miles to Beersheba from there. Then he's now going to travel to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, 260 more miles. He is racking up many miles and he, I can imagine, looking at this story, that when he comes to this juniper bush, he's exhausted and he's burnt out and he's afraid. He's scared. Physical exhaustion, lack of sleep and lack of food all contribute to bad emotional and spiritual health. When we go and go and don't stop, we can expect there not to be a breaking point. I believe there was a breaking point for him. You see, for me in my ministry, uh, you know, uh, my wife knows this about me, that uh, I won't eat unless I'm reminded sometimes. I get very busy and very like into what I'm doing. And even for, uh, we had like a winter retreat a couple weeks ago, and my wife was actually texting people while we were on the retreat saying, make Andrew eat. Make Andrew go eat. Did he eat dinner? Did he eat lunch? And so people are coming up to me. She's like, your wife says eat. Your wife says, take a break. This is a reminder because I know I'm always just going and going and going and I won't even take the time sometimes to stop and eat a meal. There's just this workaholicness in my heart that just wants to keep going and keep going. And even if it's the best of things I'm spending my time doing, me at my worst is me when I'm hungry. Anyone out there? Amen? Yeah, yeah. You don't want to see hangry Andrew. And so sometimes the most spiritual thing that we can do is to take a nap. Sometimes the most spiritually minded thing that we can do is to take a break, to eat, to reset, to refuel. This is a spiritual application here. God in this story had throughout Elijah's ministry commanded him to do many things, but he did not tell him to go to Beersheba. He did not tell him to go to Mount Horeb. Elijah was in this state of running, and look what it did. It wore him thin. You see, I think that's a principle for all of us. There are many times that we're building things in our lives that God's not telling us to build. There's things that we're prioritizing in our lives and spending our time and our resources on that God has not instructed us to do. And so what happens? We wear ourselves thin. We wear ourselves out. And then we're in this spiritual darkness Because we are exhausted. And that exhaustion, both physically and spiritually, just leads us down bad roads. When we wrongfully prioritize our lives, many times that is why I believe we find ourselves drained and burnt out. You know, years ago, I had a, a, a student who was fantastic at lacrosse. I mean, that was like his sport. He was just amazing at it. And all of his time, it became all consuming. He couldn't even like make it to youth group or church sometimes because there was tournaments, there's practices, there's training, all of that going in. So one day during a game, he falls and he lands on his leg wrong and severely damages his leg, like breaks it in multiple places and so much so that he has to get surgery on his leg and they tell him that he's gonna have to sit out the remaining of the season. And this led to something that led to a deep depression in his life because it was like the thing that he had built his life around was now taken from him and he didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to be anymore because of it. He had prioritized all of his life towards this one thing. And when it was taken away, he was like, what do I do? Who am I anymore? And what happened in that season is God began to work. He began to have time to be at church. He began to have time to be at youth group. And what I saw in him was this transformation. I remember sitting with him and saying, I think that the reason I hurt my leg is because the Lord was putting me in a timeout. Just telling me to stop for once and to take a look at my life. And in that, it it changed his perspective completely. He began to realize like, yeah, lacrosse is not life. Jesus is life. Many of us, similarly, we prioritize so many things in our lives. And we need to always be mindful of what's best for us. I believe that God will let us wear ourselves thin. He'll let us nosedive it into the ground. 
The beautiful thing is that then he's there to restore. He's there to pick up the pieces with us. And I love God's heart in this story. Elijah travels to Mount Horeb, which in scripture, as you may know, is is also known as Mount Sinai, the place in the Old Testament where Moses and the nation of Israel had come and received the Ten Commandments. God shows up. There are fireworks. There's fire from heaven. There's the power of God on display. And I find it so interesting that Elijah, in this story, he wanders for 40 days and 40 nights. For us students of the Bible, we, we know that this is, is connects, right? Not only to Jesus later in the, in the wilderness, but also 40 years that the nation of Israel wandered around in the wilderness. And so Elijah is wandering and God is gonna begin to have a conversation with him. Let's look now, verse nine. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. This is another thing that burnout does to us. It allows us to have, if it can ha- allow us to have a me-focused life rather than a God-focused life. Notice that Elijah does not answer God's question. God asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah answers why he is there. And also at the center of his, question, of his answer is what? Him. I am the only one left. I am the one who have been zealous for you. And all the people have abandoned. I'm the only one here. He's deflecting. Because what is he really doing? Nothing. He's wandering in the wilderness. He's not following God's will. He's a prophet. He's to be proclaiming to kings and to the nation the word of the Lord. And here he is, hiding in a cave. That's what he's doing. So what does he do? Deflects. Well, I am doing this. It reminds me of Adam and Eve. In the, in the book of Genesis, they sin against the Lord. And what do they go? The moment that they sin, they, they realize they're naked and they begin to go and hide. And so God says, what have you done? What have you done? And what is Adam's response? This woman that you put me here with, deflect, that you put me here with, she gave me some fruit and I ate it. It's deflecting. He points the finger, what, at God. He says, you put her here with me, God. This is your fault. And then he's also blaming Eve, saying, it's her fault. Look what she did. Deflecting the blame. Children do this all the time, right? My boys do this all the time. What are you doing? Oh, but he did it. He hit me first. Oh, but he said that first. I'm just holding this for a friend. I'm uninvolved. Deflect. Deflect the blame. Elijah was somewhere where he wasn't supposed to be. He was wandering. And remember that Elijah had a role that God had given him. He was a prophet. And so here he is hiding in a cave. I believe that he is magnifying his circumstances. He's exaggerating. I'm the only one left. There's no one else but me. I'm the only one. No one else understands. Here I am, all alone, poor, pitiful me. It's the same idea that many of us, we magnify our problems. So you think of a magnifying glass. When you take a magnifying glass and you put it up to an ant, the ant suddenly looks like a terrifying huge monster, but it's just a little ant. We magnify our circumstances, our problems, the things that we're going through, instead of magnifying God, magnifying what God has done, who he is, his power. God has moved in power in this story. And it is in magnifying our circumstances that we diminish God's providence, God's goodness, his faithfulness to us, the ways that he is still moving. Elijah was exaggerating time and time again. And so now God realizes, okay, Elijah is here for a reason. I'm gonna show up in a big way, but a way he's not gonna expect. Pay attention as we continue reading here. 1 Kings 19, 11. And so he said, God, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. 
And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking it in pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Then he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. They seek my life to take it away. God can use wind to show his power. He does that in the New Testament. We know the story of Jesus and his disciples upon the water. As Jesus walks upon the waters, a storm surrounds them, and then he speaks peace to the waves. God can show his power in earthquakes. We know that from the New Testament too. As the ground shook, as Paul and Silas worshipped in the deepest part of the prison, and the, and the chains fell off, and the doors swung open. God can show his power in earthquakes. God can show his power in fire. Elijah, if anyone, would know that. He witnessed it on Mount Carmel as God brought fire from heaven. But I love this story because look at what God does to restore Elijah. It's not in the fireworks. It's not in the big, loud displays of God's power in creation. God needed to be restored. Uh, Elijah needed to be restored. And God did it in a whisper, a gentle whisper. That's what this phrase means, a gentle blowing. God is gentle to us. God is patient with us. God is kind to us. When we need to be restored, he brings us close. Romans 2 tells us that it is his kindness that leads us to repentance. Elijah's heart had magnified the circumstances out of control and he was looking for fireworks. He was looking for another Mount Sinai moment, meeting with God. But it is in that closeness that I believe that Elijah experienced God's love and grace in a new way. Because to hear a whisper, you need to be pretty close to that source. To hear a whisper, there's closeness. There's nearness. It's beautiful. Reminds me of what the psalmist says in Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you, listen here, for those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I, might, that I may tell of all your works. Elijah lost sight of the nearness. You remember in his moment of strength as he offered a quiet prayer to the Lord a heart of devotion, a heart of nearness to God. But here he is wandering, and what does God do? Brings him close. As James tells us in in James chapter four, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. To hear the whisper, you need to come close. And so in these moments of life, when we feel like throwing it all away, we say, God, I'm done. It's in that whisper that God speaks. He speaks life that he restores. Reminds me of a mother or a father in the middle of the night hearing the cries of a, of, a, of a baby going and picking up that child saying it's okay. And in the darkness all around, the child doesn't know, but the father's arms are there. It's okay. I got you. Shh. That's the heart of God for you. His nearness is your good. 
so often we just want to run all over, run as far as we can away from him, try to solve all the world problems all on our own, carry the burden when he says, come to me, lay all that down. Elijah's response in this passage sounds familiar, doesn't it? He just said it. He repeats himself. But I think there's something different in his heart. I think that there, there's, there's a heart of, of realizing that God's really there and that God's really listening. I think before he heard himself say it a lot. But in this, I believe that, that nearness. Because then God moves him into action again. Let's look again, verse 15. The Lord said to him, go. <laughs> go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Haziel, king of Aram, and Jehu, son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall come about, the one who escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu shall put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet I leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Now reading this, as we talk about this burnout, let's talk about Elijah being exhausted. Maybe it's a little off-putting or challenging to us that what does God do? He gives him a task. He puts him back to work. And you're thinking like, whoa, like what about the rest? What about the quiet? What about the stillness? No, no, no. He commissions him back. He says, go. And we have a, a limited view maybe of, of what God is actually doing. There's a reason. These three people that are listed out in this passage are going to be a part of fulfilling Elijah's prayer. Elijah's crying out. They're worshiping Baal. They're worshiping idols. They're against you and I'm the only one left. And so God responds and says, hey, go to Haziel. Go to Jehu. Go to Elisha. And all three of these, these people in the story they're going to be a part of ridding Judah and Israel of Baal worship for a season. They're going to be a part of answering Elijah's prayer. It reminds me in the book of Habakkuk. The prophet is angry with God. Just coming before God and being like, God, when are you going to do something about all this evil that is before us? When are you going to come and set things right? And God responds in Habakkuk 1, look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. Our perspective is limited. God's perspective is unlimited. God knows the pieces that need to come into place to bring change, to bring restoration, to take what's broken and fix it. And so Elijah is going to go forward now, commissioned again to bring about this change. In the process, God's going to answer his prayer. God's plans are greater. Haziel's military might will bring defeat to Israel and judge the kingdom of Israel for their wickedness and their worship of Baal. Jehu will bring spiritual reform. It's not perfect, but don't, don't worry. First and second Kings, there's not a lot, anyone perfect. It's a lot of spiraling out of control, but Jehu will bring about spiritual reform, ridding Baal worship in Judah. And Elisha will take on the new prophetic ministry, will become a padwan to Elijah and lead under his mantle after Elijah is gone. God also reveals in this what? Elijah has never been alone. That exaggeration that I'm the only one, God says, hey, hey, I have 7,000 reserved. Like you, you, you have a limited view, Elijah. I am doing more than you think I'm doing. I'm on the move in places you don't even know where to start. God reveals that he's not alone. And I, I think that this is something for us to take away too. Because it's so often in the church that we travel through life alone. And we think that our experiences that we're going through are alone. This is something that I see in teenagers all the time. They sit next to each other in a small group. And one of them will share, 
about the brokenness of their family or the brokenness of the temptations in their life, the challenges that they're going through at school. They'll share a long list of things that they're going through. And then the next kid next to them will share about basically the same stuff. And it's like they don't even notice that each other's going through the same stuff. And so I have to sit there and be like, hey, isn't it interesting how both of you are having the same kind of struggles? And it's like, what? There's other people around me experiencing things? I know it's easy to, to, to joke about teenagers, but I think we do the same thing. We isolate ourselves from one another. We act as if what we're going through is so rare. And when there are people right here in this room that we could support one another, that we could walk through it together. Elijah was not alone in the nation of Israel. God was still moving and there were prophets that were still speaking. And so God sends him forth. And it's in that reality that when we walk together, there's this beautiful transition, isn't there? Into God's best to God's calling again. So Elijah goes forward and I believe he was restored that day on Mount Sinai. I believe that his heart was refueled in the presence of God because we don't see again Elijah saying I'm done or I'm giving up. What we see is him moving forward in confidence doing what the Lord calls him to do. And so for many of us, we need that refreshment tonight. We need that that nearness. You know that God's there. He sees us and what we're going through. To hear that gentle whisper. And I believe that God wants to pull you close tonight. If you're willing, if you would just bring it to him, he wants to draw you close to himself. He wants to remind you that he is your strength. You don't have to have it all figured out. Aren't you tired of of carrying all the weight on your own? You don't have to carry the weight of the world. He's more than capable of carrying it all for you. His nearness is your good. Lay it at his feet. Lean back against his heart. If you're weary and burdened, he's refreshment for the soul. He's living water that never runs dry. And I think many times when we come to the end of ourselves, it's like God's saying, are you done? Are you ready for me to take control again? It's like when we come to the end of ourselves, he says, guess what? I'm more than enough. I got it. If you just give it to me, you want to keep fumbling with it? Go ahead. I'm here. His nearness is our good. His plans are perfect and he will accomplish it. He will give us the victory. He is more than enough. And so what does it take from us? It takes from us just releasing grip, letting go, surrendering it to him. Oh, how often we wander about like Elijah, just just wandering and just wanting to throw in the towel. God gets it. He is familiar with your sorrow. He's familiar with your grief, your transgressions, your failings. He knows all of it because he carried it for you. And he wants to give you victory. So we need to take our eyes off of ourselves. We need to look again to him. There's a hymn that I I love. It's a hymn that is near and dear to my heart. I wanna read the lyrics for you as we close here. It says, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, the peace we often forfeit. Oh, what pain we bear. All we, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. He knows your weakness. He knows your trials and temptations. He knows your burdens and your troubles, your shortcomings. Take it to him. And in that gentle whisper, that nearness, that closeness, He will restore. 
he will restore. Seek and you will find. And guess what? When it says seek, it means keep seeking and you'll keep finding. Keep knocking and he'll keep answering. Keep running to him. His arms are open wide. He is more than enough. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows your circumstances better than you know it. He is a bigger God understanding of your circumstances. Look to him, trust him, hold fast and be refreshed. Lord God, we just thank you so much for that tonight. Lord, that you are our friend, that you call us friend that we're not alone in the battle, Lord, that you are faithful to us. You know all of our struggles, all of our weakness. And that's just how good of a God you are because you are our strength. You are our refuge and your love is more than enough. And so Jesus, I pray over anyone in this room tonight that has felt like they were wandering, they've wandered off course, or maybe just they've lost sight. Like Elijah, they're looking at their circumstances and magnifying them to such a point where they say, I don't know how this could ever be changed. Lord, I pray tonight, you just whisper to them. What are you doing here? Don't you know that I got you? Don't you know that I've called you? Don't you know that I love you? Don't you know that I'm more than enough? Jesus, we thank you for that. And if that's you tonight, church, would you just raise your hand right now? And just in, in that moment of raising your hand, you're saying, Lord, I surrender. I lay my burdens down to you, Jesus. I surrender it all to you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you so much for everyone here that is moved by your spirit. I pray, Lord, that they would walk forward in confidence, refreshed, refueled, and ready for the day, Lord, because your mercies are new every morning that you're more than enough for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, church, I want to uh, invite you to stand to your